It is. It's really interesting. And, you know, again, it can change week to week with somebody dependent on what's actually going on for them. They can come in and be, you know, quite adaptive one week and then quite free spirited the next week. And then, you know, feeling completely different the week after. Yeah. And if somebody is top heavy in parent ego state, in other words, what that means is they spend a lot of energy. Yeah coming from an internalized power position it means their child goes underground and they will appear pretty judgmental yeah see things in black and white terms and there is a heavy heavy emphasis on what you talked about earlier control rather than spontaneity yeah <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 77 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about using humour, joy and spontaneity in the therapy room. Sounds a wonderful topic. I better be, uh, I better be, have a level of spontaneity then. Yes. Through this podcast. I and just... joy and humour. Let's go for it. Yeah, they all, all come at once. I've just come back off holiday, about a week on holiday in Gran Canaria. So I have a sense of... Uh, I think joy as we speak, even though coming back, I, I didn't want to come back. Um, so, which is really good when you're on holiday, isn't it? Yeah. And you actually don't want to come back. Yeah. That's <clears> a good <throat> holiday. Yes, yeah, so that was good. But I've come back. And the weather's not too bad, but the sky compared to the sky, you know, was before when I was in the Canary Islands, it's very different. Yeah. It's a different type of blue. But anyway, I'm rambling on. Yes, joy, humour, spontaneity. Now, one thing about being a therapist I really understand is that it's really important to model down to your clients the three topics we're talking about here, I believe. Spontaneity, yeah. humour, you know, are really important uh, things to model down. Um, you know, so I think spontaneity and joy and humour are part of um, I, what we need to pass down to our clients. Otherwise, what can often happen is clients really go into these dark places quite often. They, 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 there's no light in the tunnel. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I think, think those, dark... those things you don't necessarily expect to have in a therapy room. Oh, 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 right. Uh, it, it, do you mean, now that's an interesting sentence, do you mean from your perspective or do you mean this is how the public see therapy? I mean, I, yeah, I think it's how it's perceived. But I also think that the client doesn't always expect those things from therapy. What do you think? That's a really interesting. What do you think uh, from your perspective again? What do you think a client does expect then? That every session has to be deep and meaningful and do you know what I mean they don't always associate that with joy and humor it needs to be I don't know doom and gloom somehow no no no, no you're very clear I understand what you mean that you that you're saying the the therapy sessions um you think clients think should be intense yeah heavy yeah uh, um a sense of uh darkness and maybe gloom doom goes with that and they don't see therapy sessions as particularly a time where they can express any spontaneity, humour or joy. Yeah. It's not think... the place. <clears throat> yeah. And I think that's, you know, the general public as well think that. Mm -hmm. I, th I think there's an element that's true. And I like to think the clients have, and I think with you probably as well, because I know you have a great sense of humour, um, but I was thinking the clients that have seen me over the years, um, I hope, uh, also see times when they come to see me, um, has some light in yeah. the whole process. 
uh, because you can only stick your head down the toilet bowl for so long. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. And I think it's important for me that the client understands my sense of humour, that it's not misinterpreted in the therapy room. For what? I don't know. For making light of a situation that might not necessarily be, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes complete sense. That's why I asked the question for what, because I think you're correct. I think sometimes clients may, if they don't know you very well anyway, um, perhaps perceive maybe your humour as uh, making light of something they shouldn't be made light of. However, as they get to know you, they'll know your humour better, understand that's not the case. Yeah. And so the same with me. And also another thing about this is that I think people can only stay suffering for so long. Yeah. They need some light. Yeah. That has to be modelled down. Otherwise, they go away often in a state of um, sort of mini depression, if you like. Uh, yeah. And may not allow themselves to experience the sun for at least another week, perhaps. Yeah. And, you know, obviously dependent on the trauma that the client's gone through, you know, one of the things I often say is that that doesn't define who they are. You know, we we, we can go through some horrendous things, but still enjoy life and still find joy. Oh, you couldn't have said more important words yeah and and you know for me personally re more recently you know doing things that bring me joy is really important to me <laughs> you know and it, it should be with a client as well yeah we can go to those dark places but exactly like you said we don't need to stay there you know it, it is important that we do things you know self-care and all those things that we want to do outside of the therapy room mm. Mm. absolutely correct and i think people who come say with depression and there's different levels of depression from moderate mild and severe so um i know it could be seen as a blanket term but i think to for the therapist to model down a sense of lightness if you like um is important for people to understand that there's times when they could allow the, themselves to see some light in the tunnel yeah yeah, because that's it makes it more bearable. Yeah. yeah. Now, that doesn't mean a therapist that spends, you know, 59 minutes of the hour being cracking jokes. I don't mean those sorts of things. Yeah. Or um, I mean things where where there's some, some sense of humour sometimes um, delivered. Yeah. Uh, there's a, some sense of um, lightness in the darkness. Uh, I think it's important. Yeah, me too, hundred percent. Yeah, mm. and it's about looking at things from a different perspective sometimes as well. Say a little bit more because I think that's important. Um, they're not re-experiencing the trauma over and over. Do you know what I mean? That we give them the opportunity to look at things. You know, yes, and this might sound a bit <clears throat> weird, but even if we go through some horrific things what what have we learned from it what can we take from it what are the positives from it that often a client can't see that there are any positives from their experiences quite often and i don't want the listeners to not you know confuse what both of us are saying uh i think both of us are saying the same thing which is therapy is a serious business yes and we need to treat the trauma the discomfort or whatever the client comes with great dignity and seriousness. Yeah. So instead of us saying that, I think we're saying that in this, we could also allow ourselves some um, t time to have some relaxation, if you like, mm. to take care of ourselves, uh, not, in, not in a place where we just have to incapacitate and see darkness all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I use humour or you know, maybe a different conversation to, to ground a client. Do you know what I mean? Well, once the session's coming to an end, to have a different type of conversation before the client leaves the room, particularly if it's been a heavy one. Mm. That's right. 
and on another level completely um quite often the client that comes in that is um you know like a solemn little boy if you like mm -hmm. um where they may have t lost t touch of all joy in their life you often find as you as you explore their history they've been programmed yeah to be joyless to be solemn little boy um and you'll find out actually that the parents are exactly the same yeah so it's often to do with their histories it doesn't have to be a trauma-laden process we're talking about but they may have been programmed or been in a house or a family yeah. where not not much joy was expressed yeah yeah and everything's serious yeah mm -hmm. and they then grow up thinking well that's how life is so actually when people express joy or laughter around them they don't know what to do yeah or they feel uncomfortable yeah yeah which again is something that can be worked through in therapy and mm -hmm. you know it's it's like sometimes I feel clients, it's a no oh. situation. They have to be either depressed or happy. They, they can't be both at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and our emotions and our feelings shift literally from moment to moment. It's not like, you know, for the whole 50 minutes, you need to be just showing one emotion. Otherwise, I'm not going to take you seriously. We can dip in and out of things. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's normal. If, yeah. if there's such a thing as normality, I'm, a, you know, I don't. I, I, I'm living long enough now. I'm not sure what normality is, but I, I'll use that phrase with a pinch of salt, if you like. But I think it's normal to um, dip out and dip in, if you like. Yeah. To different ego states and different emotional expressions. Yeah, and again, you know the 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 humor and the joy can be used sometimes as a way of deflecting things with the clients mm. you know the gallows laugh and all those sorts of things it, it, you know if a client's using it excessively it, it can be a way of deflecting from what's actually going on for them yes absolutely and I was thinking about um something I shared with you I think on one of the podcasts about groups because I was a group therapist for a very long time. Yeah. And I used to share, I did share this with you, yeah, but I used to start every group with two or three minutes of good news. In other yeah. words, so there's eight people in the group, which is invariably there was. I would say, okay, just go around and with your check-in, I'd like you to check in some good news. Now, you can define what good is, but but I like to start this way. And I started it because that way because I wanted to give people permission to at least think about the potential of some uh, good in inverted commas event that has happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. At least we're starting off a different frame. Yeah. And it's an opportunity for them to share their wins and successes as well within a group, which is a really nice place to be able to do it and get support from from other people. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, there's, so I'm more worried about people who come in the therapy room and haven't got the ability to have uh, spontaneity, humor, and joy than probably most clients. Because if a person has lost those capacities, we know something they've had a traumatic history. Yeah. We know it. Yeah. So say a little bit more about spontaneity in the therapy room. How, how, how are you thinking about that? That the client is spontaneous or that we're spontaneous in the therapy room? Okay. So in normal conversation, you've probably never done this, Jackie, and I don't uh, do this much. You know, I only do, the, I only think about what I'm going to say now clinically. Yeah. But it, 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 I don't, I'm using the word normal again, very lightly understand. But in general conversation, if you if you say to somebody, have you had a good day? And they'll reply back or their response might be yes or no. And 
things were particularly hard today because of this and you might say something back again now if you clinically talk about or you could do in general life if you wanted to but time how quickly it takes for the response to come back so if I said to you you know have you had a good day and you said yes I've had a good day it was really wonderful if you time between the difference between stimulus and response it might be what a couple of seconds yeah yeah if that if, yeah if that right the more depressed the person is the more they've lost the capacity of spontaneity joy and humor the response will take much longer to come back right yeah so for example I remember this so well and, I, and this client worked with me for seven or eight years by the way but when I first saw him I would say the response I think and I remember counting in my head took at least eight or nine seconds to come back mm. that is a long time by the way yeah what? two three four five six seven eight now that's a long time I almost gave up the will to live at one level but clinically yes. yeah clinically extremely sad yeah because what actually was happening for the person on the other side by the way to take eight seconds was there their level of spontaneity had decreased unfortunately what had increased was their level of mistrust their level of adaptation their level of depression their level of paranoia and often what had happened is I say how are you so they go to the different committees in their heads to think oh well you know is this person asking me a trick question or what's why is he saying that or what shall I answer here so that I don't xxxx yeah go through a series of committees before the answer comes back yeah if it takes eight seconds that's a long time it is it is to be answering a, a question like how's your week been yeah yeah now when the person has left that left over with me um it was down to about three seconds well done great improvement yeah their level of spontaneity of course is much higher yeah so without spontaneity um a person mental health probably uh has decreased in terms of what we're talking about here yeah their paranoia has probably gone up the level of adaptation to you has probably gone up therefore their natural self has gone down their level of incapacitation uh, is much higher the level of mistrust for you is usually much higher yeah these are all the indications of uh problems in mental health so if the capacity of spontaneity is decreased to the extent that we're talking about here or even less it's a pretty good indication for poor mental health yeah because again I see a lack of spontaneity around needing to be in control mm, of their environment you not only yeah. of what they're actually saying but also their environment like you said there's a lot of internal dialogue going on it's a, it's a really good point you just made that if they are um they need to be in control heavily in control their yeah. level of spontaneity has certainly decreased because usually in ta terms there's a heavy controlling parent yeah so therefore the spontaneity in the child has decreased is a sign of um poor mental health usually yeah because their their child capacities for for freedom for laughter for humor for spontaneity has all gone out the window yeah so taking this place usually is adaptation to the controlling parent that there's a started to express this need um for control yeah because a lot of the time we do associate these these things with the 
child ego state or the carefree, you know, yourself. side of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And in t- again, I know I'm speaking TA terms again, but if you look at the lack of spontaneity, joy and, joy and humour, it usually means there's a repressed child, a repressed younger self that can't get out. Yeah. Usually it's because of this heavy parent they are on themselves. Yeah. It is. It's really interesting. And, you know, again, it can change week to week with somebody, dependent on what's actually going on for them. They can come in and be, you know, quite adaptive one week and then quite free-spirited the next week and then, you know feeling completely different the week after yeah and if somebody is top heavy in parent ego state in other words what that means is they spend a lot of energy yeah coming from an internalized parent position it means their child goes underground and they will appear pretty judgmental yeah see things in black and white terms and there is a heavy, heavy emphasis on what you talked about earlier, control rather than spontaneity. Yeah. Because it, 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 it makes their environment a lot safer if they feel like they're in control of it, yeah, which goes on to what you were saying about lack of trust. Mm, mm. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll see it in couples therapy a lot, what I'm talking about here. You'll, you know, where one partner expresses a lot of energy from their parent ego state yeah and therefore the other partner uh then is coming from usually a very adapted repressed repressed child position yeah and the therapy is usually about helping people unstick their particular parts of themselves so they've got freedom to go up and down different ego states yeah yeah which is enlightening if if somebody doesn't know about the ego states and how we move through them or whatever. It, you know it is something I, I can remember when i was training in it that was really enlightening mm, mm. yeah i mean you're right uh, a sign of health if you like is when you can move um with a sense of freedom between and flexibility between different parts of the cells now in ta that's called paired adult so you know, it's a tripart model, parent, yeah. child. The problems come again in TA terms, but we could I could think of other psychotherapy models when we get stuck in one part of the self and don't have access to the different energy sources in other parts of the self. Yeah. So there's no spot no so if there's little spontaneity or flexibility, it means that usually we're quite rigid and stuck yeah in one part of ourselves yeah so good mental health is when we can go you know with the flexibility and spontaneity um from the different parts of our own self yeah and in the therapy room you know for me i always give the client permission to be whatever it is that they want to be in that room <laughs> You know, I can remember when I was doing my training, you know, I think somebody asked me, how often are you in your child? And I said, hardly ever, because I'd like to think that I'm in my adult the majority of the time. But the more you look at it, the more I realised, actually, I flip mm. quite often. You know, I'm not in my adult. I'd probably say 60% of the time I'm somewhere else. Yeah, stuck in our younger self. Yeah. Or stuck in our internalised parent in theatre language again. Yeah, yeah. And again, like you were saying, modelling that down, I think, is really important, that we can be lighthearted and spontaneous and and do all those things. It doesn't mean that we're being childish. It's it's part of the three parts of ourselves, yeah. And we can be serious at the same time. Yeah. We can do both these things. Yeah. And that's the really important part that we could we can take people seriously we can yeah. take serious, seriously the problems and also model some sense of um spontaneity in the process yeah 
Yeah, because like you said, they, they might not have been brought up in a family where that was, you know, they were given permission to do that or, you know, they were yeah. allowed to. Yeah. yeah, get in touch with their inner free child in TA terms. Again. Now, one thing we do have to be careful with, and we mentioned it earlier in this podcast, I don't want to come back to this, is humour. And you touched on it where, um, in the sense of the, per the pe perception of the client. In other mm -hmm. words, it's really important the child doesn't think we're laughing. You know, the child in yeah. the client or the younger self in the client doesn't think we're laughing at them. Yeah. Or shaming them. Yeah. Or yeah. Shaming them. So humor is important in terms of modeling, in terms of creating a lighter space, the things we talk about in the podcast. And at the same time, we need to check the the person on the other side doesn't think we're, you know, laughing at them or shaming them. So we, I think we have to think about this clinically. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think it's a really important one. If, because if we're not thinking like that, I think some of the therapy ruptures uh, might happen. Yeah. If it's used inappropriately in the therapy room, yeah. Mm, I think with, with humour, and to start off with, I probably use humour with and for <clears throat> myself first off. Mm. You know, if I make a mistake or if I get something wrong, being able to, do you know what I mean, throw it off or make fun of myself in the therapy room, you mm -hmm. know, as a starting point for them to get to know me you know life doesn't always need to be serious that's right there's a sense of being able to not you know take ourselves with a pinch of salt as well yeah model that as well it's important to think about because i think that's one of the criticisms around or can be around um, being too bringing humor in too much if we don't think about how the other person's receiving it yeah yeah and again it's, it's about being mindful of that and being you know aware of the responses to it in the therapy room and then maybe bringing that up mm -hmm. that's, yeah. yeah that's the part that is the part you know uh, um how do you feel when it would would we're this way in the therapy are you, are you feeling that we're taking you seriously or or whatever it is, we check yeah. it up. But I do believe modelling spontaneity is really important. Yeah. And again, like you say, so that the listeners don't misunderstand it, it's, you know, the, there is there is always a, a long-term goal and aim in therapy, therapy. Being spontaneous doesn't mean that we're just throwing caution to the wind and doing whatever comes up our back <laughs> in every session. Yeah. Mm. So there's a lot in it, but I do think it's important, these capacities, because um, they're a monitor for positive mental health. Yeah. Yeah. Because, as always, we, we are complex beings. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah. I've enjoyed that, Bob. Okay, great. I enjoyed talking about it, and... I, I I do think the, the capacities we just talked about there are, are barometers for positive mental health. So I think it's an important thing we think about. Yeah. yeah. So if anybody has any questions on that, they can comment on our YouTube channel where these yeah. go up if they, they want to ask you any more questions about being humorous, having joy and being spontaneous in the therapy room. But next time, we're going to be talking a little bit about understanding the importance of working with unmet relational needs in therapy. That's a long title, Bob. It's a long time. Simply, it's about how we work with the unmet parts of ourselves in terms of needs. Yeah. So until next time, Bob. Yeah. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.